Welcome everybody, Marianne, Professor Chairman, thanks for inviting me here to uh, Amsterdam to give you my, my talk today. Um, and I'm going to slightly take in a different angle to some of the uh, kind of pathogens and infections we've been speaking about this morning. But something else that causes a lot of morbidity and mortality, tragically, asthma and allergies and how that's linked to the, the built environment. And hopefully uh, just change some thinking on it and invite a bit of debate later on and tell you about my personal story. So I'm going to talk about our company, Allergy Standards, and the three pillars of our company is our standards, our certification, our academy and our institute as well. At the end, I'd like to welcome you uh, as stakeholders of this society to consider uh, participating in our institute as well. What I'm going to start with is a story of how did this, this young guy here, this junior doctor, used to work a lot in, in Africa and in Kenya, and, and then also as a junior doctor in Tala Hospital in Dublin. Why am I standing here in Amsterdam talking to these stakeholders about indoor air quality? Well, it all starts from a very busy night in the emergency room in the Children's Hospital. That's the National Children's Hospital in Dublin, Ireland, in Harcourt Street, just off St. Stephen's Green, if anybody's been there, the old historic area. And a very busy uh, night in the emergency room and patient after patient coming in, generally kids and with the parents would generally be the mum of a kid with asthma and allergy coming in out of hours, missing school, late at night. And the question would constantly come to me, look doctor, is there something we can do to stay well rather than having to come into you and you treat us when we're sick? And when you're talking about asthma and allergy, uh, particularly allergic asthma and allergy, you're talking about the indoor environment and trigger factors and things that set off your symptoms. And patients are very interested now, particularly in being proactive. We're seeing that in, in healthcare throughout, uh, wearables, watches, even the rise of meditation, that people want to stay well and they don't, they don't want to over rely on doctors when they become sick. So when you start to, to talk to patients about avoiding triggers, we know from earlier speakers we spend 80% of our time indoors. I'm sure we all know the US stats that indoor air pollution can be four to five more times polluted than outdoor air. Um, and it gets quite difficult to um, patients to understand all the triggers in the home and then how to avoid them. So I would give them advice, but what they wouldn't have is what we describe as actionable insights. Now I know, doctor, about formaldehyde or I know about dust mite allergen or in America in urban areas it could be cockroach allergen. But what do I actually do about that? When I'm choosing certain types of air cleaners or vacuum cleaners or cleaning products, even the building materials we design and construct our buildings out of that may outgas formaldehyde, um, I get overwhelmed when I go to the point of purchase. So one of the mums said, look, doc, wouldn't it be really helpful if there's actually a sign or a symbol or a lighthouse in the fog to cut through all this and we would know this product will contribute to our overall uh, improving indoor air quality and avoidance of triggers. And it comes to this whole concept of trust. And if you imagine if your child was diagnosed with asthma and allergy into the emergency room out of hours, how would you feel? Um, and this kind of, well, who can I rely on? And when they go out there, they can actually see a lot of bad science, a lot of marketing gimmicks. And that's our kind of our enemy. We all want to have one common enemy, enemy and ours is bad science. So if you look at some of the guidelines, this is from the National Institute of Health, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. Now, this is our, as doctors, our treatment guidelines. And I'm not going to go into the complexity of it, but if you want to think, this is what, now these are terms you shouldn't use anymore, like rescue relievers. But this is your blue puffer, your brown puffer. Then you're adding in oral medication like steroids, your treatment escalation. But what's really interesting about this diagram is that for every stage is patient education and environmental control at each step. And that includes the first step. So as a doctor, we're not supposed to start people on medication until we've done patient education and environmental control. Do you know if you're allergic to something? And do you know is that allergenic trigger turning up in your environment? And what have you done in a measurable way to actually remove it, source control or elimination or um, reduce exposure to it? And then we start on medication. And then if that's working, we're supposed to go back to the homes, have occupational nurses and look at these issues. Please do, yeah. Uh, I had the experience, my son was getting a little bit uh, without breathing air. Yep. So I went to the, uh, the, the, the first responder at the hospital. Yeah. Um, and I said, okay, um, he needs some puffer and then it's uh, finished. Yeah. So he got some puffer there. Yeah. And they said, okay, just buy some other puffer here at the uh, medical uh, part and then, uh, then you're finished, you can go home. Yeah. So I went with my son to this uh, place to buy all the medicines. Then he just, fainted. 
yeah. because of this medicine. Mm -hmm. And I wonder um, what is the motivation for the doctors to provide this poison to people? They don't investigate anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Let me stop the camera rolling. <laughs> no, no, okay, you're, you know. Have, yeah. Of course, it sounds like this, and then yeah. use this, and yeah. then that's it. No, I mean, and, and listen, I need, I need to put some caveats in it. If, if somebody has a medical condition, you need to go see a doctor, and a doctor and, and medicine is the cornerstone of healthcare management. But the reason why I founded my company is for exact that reason. It was to kind of give, empower patients for the education and ask and say, well, can we, can we start uh, with environmental control and become an educated patient? And that, that's what we're trying to do, empower people. Um, and there is, and well, we could have a very long round table about what the motivations are, billing practices, um, time constraints, resource constraints, patients demanding magic bullets and antibiotics, and that came up earlier about antimicrobial resistance. So there is a big cultural issue there that we could have a very long debate about. What I was trying to do with our certification program is actually to try and rebalance that and put some power back into patients to have an informed conversa conversation with their doctor. Um, one of the big takeaways from, from COVID is that uh, because there was digital consultations, doctors now actually had a window into people's homes with a laptop. And they say, could you pick up your laptop and actually just show me around your bedroom the way your child sleep? And then they did environmental control and education around that. So there's now evidence of what the medics call bi bi-directional feedback loops, which is essentially listening and talking to your patient. They're now actually showing patients getting much more involved in environmental control, uh, is reducing the amount of medications that are required and so forth. So your anecdotal story is the exact foundational story of why I set the company up. I think that the doctors don't think that much. They just use, okay, this is the uh, thing what I see and this is on my list, so I have to do that. There, there hasn't been an... an the, di well, digital medicine had algorithm, al algorithm makes, they've guided conversations with algorithms, if this then that, without actually really stopping. And, I, and I, I, I teach innovation in the medical school and I encourage doctors, as we adopt more and more digital um, technologies, don't forget foundationally, as a medic, you have that ability to have a conversation and examine your patients and go back to old Victorian skills. And when you get that empathic listening relationship with your patients, they do better rather than algorithmic medicine, yeah, yeah. So it's great, it's great. Um, um, so just by way, of, by show of hands, who here actually in the room, if you're happy, ha has asthma? So that would be 20 people, it's normally about one in 20. Who here has allergies or any kind of connected allergy or so? Okay, a Cup, couple bit more. Okay, then who here in the room knows somebody or lives in a home with somebody of asthma or allergies? And that would be over 50%. And final question, who, in the, who here in the room breathes? <laughs> okay, we all breathe. Okay, good, good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so this is this is this is what we know. We've spoken about air quality a lot today, and we've spoken a lot air quality cleaning technologies, but. Air quality is really about a healthy building. Our outcome is to have healthy environments where we live in. The problem is, is whether what we build the, the, the house with, how we ventilate it, how we manage it, our cleaning products, how we live in it. We spoke about perfumes and VOCs. We spoke about cleaning and, uh, sorry, not cleaning. We did speak about cleaning, but cooking and particulate matters and lighting candles and so forth. So it very quickly gets uh, overwhelming for people to actually really know easily how to manage a healthy indoor environment. If you then go to the FDA, we spoke a lot about the FDA this morning as well. I mean, this surprised a lot of people. If you look here about the word hypoallergenic, particularly as in chemicals, there's no scientific basis whatsoever for the use of the word hypoallergenic on anything. Pillows, cleaning devices, it just means it's made up, it's completely fabricated. And people, they, 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 it's like them telling that Father Christmas doesn't exist. They put so much trust in this word hypoallergenic and they believe somebody somewhere has actually gone off and tested it. They haven't, and that's the US FDA. And then as they go and try and solve these problems a little bit more, they'll see things like this from the Federal Trade Commission, where Oric was a vacuum cleaner company, subsequently uh, was acquired by TTI. Um, but they had a UV light, and I think some of the technologies in, this, in here are UV light. But they made clinical claims, and as we've heard this morning about medical devices and clinical claims without having clinical data, which we must be very careful not to make clinical claims unless we have randomized prospective uh, clinical data trials. But they, they, they were fine this, but they actually had to withcall the products and put the company out of business. So you, then if you look a bit further, you have something like this. This is a slide from the UK. It's the allergy advice on a carton of eggs, and you know, it may contain traces of egg. Um, so th there's this real difficulty when people are told by their doctor to go and seek 
That's our guidelines. I show you the National Institute of Health guidelines. We're told to go and tell patients to go and seek products that contribute to improving the indoor environment. But they're met with this kind of confusion of FDA, FTC, CPC, and so forth. So that's what we decided. Could we develop a, a meaningful scientific evidence-based uh, certification testing protocol that we could find products that work? And generally, we look at safety testing. Is it safe? We know there's air cleaners out there that aren't safe and can produce ozone. We know that people in the past have, have told people to inject uh, uh, bleach into their veins for COVID. So there's clearly things that are not safe. And then there's other things that may be safe, but they don't work. So are they effective? And then is the product governed by good science or is it actually just good marketing like that word hypoallergenic? And they're the principles of our certification standards. Um, and this is the outcome of what we do. We have this certification symbol like organic or vegan that goes on products that people can identify it, that it's a better cho choice. It has suitability criteria, performance criteria that will actually contribute to a healthier indoor environment. And then our model in the, in the US where, where we work uh, is we will partner then with the National Patient Advocacy Group in America, that's the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and then they will endorse our standards, they'll do physician activation strategies for us, and actually get the knowledge of the certification out to all the GPs in, in America. Which you Giovanni photo model? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> without, without the glasses. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the fact that it's, it's within doctors' waiting rooms is doctors don't like to recommend or endorse a product. But what they can say is there is an evidence-based certification program run by the National Patient Advocacy Group and these products have reached that standard. So they're not recommending a Dyson or whatever it may be, they're recommending the certification program. And it's worked very well, it's resonated with people, we've, had, we've worked with Disney toys, we have a companion app that people can scan barcodes, we've ended up on TV, we've even had our own TV ads and some really big brands are involved in the certification program. And it's really, as we've worked with brands, we realize they're struggling to get that human connection, that storytelling, and as mentioned earlier this morning, how do we make air invisible? How do we make that visible with kind of an empathic storytelling? Um, and that's what the brands we work with, the PR companies, this is a way to engage in a meaningful, authentic, permission-based way with their clients and a two-way uh, two street about informing them of how to have a healthy home, not just selling them product, we're selling benefits and education. And really this is, this is our, our kind of concept that um, when you know better, we're a knowledge company, we transmit that knowledge through certification, but we also do it through the Institute and the Academy. But we believe, just like as we're convening here this morning, as we exchange ideas and when you know better, you, you do better. It's that concept of actionable insights. So, Allergy Standards as a company started very much products, we moved into services and now the overall indoor environment. We started with Disney and Toys R Us, we then partnered with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation. And then these, these brands, and as we moved into services and cleaning environments, we then got into overall environmental management with the Energy Efficient Building Alliance. We spoke a little bit early on about the the connection between energy efficiency and how much it costs to drive air through media-based filters. And then with GBAC, the Building Owner and Managers Alliance, that came up a bit this morning, and I'll talk about, about buildings and ESG. And then now, top of the left-hand corner, our relationship with the Indoor Air Quality Society. So we've transitioned very much from a kind of a toy idea right out to environments and managing the indoor environment. Okay, so that's allergy standards. Now, what I'd like to talk about more is about healthy indoor environments and what are they and why are they important. We've already spoken about adverse weather events and the outdoor environment being an issue and certainly now it's on people's minds about outdoor air quality. Um, and you'll see with climate change, this is a, a slide from the Centers of Disease Control in the US about how climate change is impacting on us all generally on health and wellness, the outdoor environment, but particularly as it relates to longer allergy seasons, certain parts of America getting more moist, uh, more mold buildup, uh, air pollution and so on and so forth. So, Climate control in the outdoor environment is, is impacting on asthma and allergy. Sorry, I'll pop that back for you. The slides, the slides will be available anyway. It's always a good sign when there's lots of photographs of your uh, kind of little KPI of uh, people taking photographs. Um, but also with the recent pandemic, and we, we talked about a lot about that this morning, um, you know, hopefully COVID or this, this pandemic is in our rear view mirror, but um, I think a lot of the societal change have been driven by the pandemic aren't going to go back. Like, for example, I think I'm the only person in the room wearing a necktie. I mean, they're, they're just kind of gone now. But also, even if you ever thought when somebody sneezes, as you say, bless you. 
Well, that was from the, the bubonic plague, the Black Death in London over 300 years ago. It started with the respiratory infection. So if you sneezed, you were on the way to, to dying this horrible disease. So that's something that came into society over 300 years ago, but still persists to this very day. And we don't even know why do I say bless you. So the attitudes, this invisible air becoming visible and people being connected to it is not going away. And I think it's really relevant for, for this room. So yeah, so, so again, I know the people in the room, we all know this stuff. We know that we breathe 2,000 gallons of air. It's the largest thing you consume on a daily basis, more food, more liquid. You don't eat food off dirty plates. You don't drink water out of, of dirty glasses. So why is it acceptable for us to breathe dirty air? It's the largest thing we consume. But like this poor old goldfish here, often we're the last to actually see the air. You actually don't realize your air is dirty. Well, you weren't aware about it, or you certainly weren't told about it. But is that, is that going back? Um, and there's all this concept of, of health and health and wellness. And health no longer, as I said, those people who came to me in my emergency room, it's not just the absence of disease, it's overall health. And it's about emotional health. We have this mind-body connection. I spoke about mindfulness. Uh, we've, we talk about um, ESG and diversity, equity, inclusion, about going to work, about bringing ourself, but bringing our whole self to work, whether it's your race or your sexual orientation. And this is the whole idea of being inclusive. And that's all becoming in to the, to, to the, to the health of society and societal justice. And that also relates to the built environment. And I think most of our products and services, whether it's an airborne aircraft or a building, relates to the built environment. So if that's the new definition of health, and that's the definition of a building, what is a healthy building in today's world? And how do we actually get up to speed in this? And how do, does this society impact on, on the healthy homes, healthy schools, healthy airplanes, healthy buses, and so forth? And when you get to buildings, buildings are very much in the American economy part, part of the whole capital structure of America. So people buy buildings and they get rental yields on buildings. So they all have these new ESG metrics, you know, it's obviously from the United Nations originally. Um, back originally came from, from apartheid is, is where it originally started. But this whole concept of ESG being measurable, being metrics, Matt Ellis gave a superb talk on the Building Owner and Managers Association about m measuring ESG in, in buildings and real estate. But when you look at ESG, people think E, the environment, they think carbon and energy efficiency and carbon capture. But where in ESG is the word health? It's not in there. Where is the word diversity, equity and inclusion? And people kind of get indoor air quality, energy efficiency, ESG, all that alphabet soup. I think we mentioned about TLAs uh, earlier on. People are quite confused about that. I think it's a role for this society to actually navigate the relevance of air quality in that and also then the relevance to the United Nations Sustainable Goals and how ESG and the STGs are connected. And if you work with companies now, even as an employee value proposition about retaining and attracting talent, air quality in healthy buildings is not only well, what does my company do, do we actually impact on society and I want to work with a purpose-driven company, but where I work, well I was at home, now you want me to go back into the office to do innovation workshops, surely my workplace has to be at least as healthy as my home where I was and if we're going to attract people back into workplaces, that environment has to be healthy and it's absolutely key we get that and this kind of concept of doing well and doing good both for employees as an occupational exposure or the kids in your school or the companies you want to work for. And there's an emerging expression now, you may be familiar with it, but I really like it. It's called One Health. And it's the idea of healthy planet, but healthy people. Sustainability has been very much about the planet, which is great, but really where the puck is going is health and wellness. And you can talk about planet and people, and broadly you can talk about CO2s and the outdoor air and VOCs and indoor air. But how are we going to join those conversations and be relevant on both sides of the ledger? Um, I had the, the, the pleasure of meeting Bernice King, that's Martin Luther King's daughter in Atlanta at Greenbuild. I gave a keynote on healthy buildings at Greenbuild. And this type of stuff we discussed afterwards. It was actually the first ever Health and Wellness Summit, a US Green Build. But a lot of the conversations we've been having this morning, same thing again um, about partnership. How are we going to partner up on this new schools project? The idea that's all integrated and interconnected as well. Um, and the fact that nobody, no doctor is going to be able to solve this issue, no air cleaner device company, no building architect. We're going to have to collaborate together. And it's good. collaboration is the new leadership. This is a fascinating slide, and again, it's from, from America, but I'll just talk you through it. Essentially, the US budget of healthcare was going up and it's unsustainable, but 85% of the US healthcare budget goes on access to doctors and to medication. But if you look down here, our environments that we live in and our behaviors within those environments is about 70% of our health outcomes. So many 
chronic healthcare issues in America, and to some extent asthma and allergy, but certainly obesity, heart disease and blood pressure, smoking, so forth, don't need more emergency room doctors like me and more white coats. They need patient education. They're educational issues, not medication issues. And if you look at the numbers here, what actually impacts on the health outcomes and where we spend the money, that needs to, to, be, to be adjusted. And I think that's part of this, this society here. And the way I frame this, I want to teaching modules in the academy. If you, if you think you've got me, I used to be an ER doc, an ER surgeon, that's very much at the red end of your spectrum and it's very reactive. And then you may have specialist healthcare professionals, your family doctor, your nurse, your wound nurse, your asthma nurse, then you have your physio. But you can keep continuing out that spectrum where you get on the proactive side of it and maintenance of wellness. And you have your dietitian, your yoga teacher, your meditation. All these people actually will impact. And as a slide before, they actually impact more on when you're actually spending your money down here. And my argument is building related professionals and people like this society impact on our environment are on that spectrum and will be part of that conversation as we, as we go forward. Um, but it's tricky and I think we've already touched on this little, a little bit earlier. It's about designing buildings, about uh, building them and constructing them and managing them. But in the last energy crisis, a lot of the material science came out of uh, in Jimmy Carter when there was the first Suez Canal and all that energy crisis, and we tightened buildings. Build right you know, and ventilate. Build tight and ventilate right was the mantra. But what actually happened uh, was outgassing and VOCs and furniture now became an issue because of the energy efficiency. So if you're trying to get energy efficiency in a building, we, we spoke about the cost of media filtration already, that's going to impact on indoor air quality and therefore what we put in that building, the incidental furniture, how we clean, how we manage, how we live in that building. You can't touch one of them without touching the other. And it's this concept of integrated building science. It's not just the air cleaner companies uh, or the sensor technologies or the material science or the designers the airflow. We have to come together in a collaboration like the society uh, for wellness in buildings and wellness in the built environment. I also spoke at the International Builder Show and this is a slide I pinched off them um, and they spoke a lot about external stresses on buildings and in America a lot of researchers understand there was a tornado in France yesterday apparently but, but about um, uh, resilient buildings and building buildings and hurricane areas and tornado areas and insurance premiums coming down if you make resilient buildings and extra buttresses on roofs and things like that and they've done very very accurate uh, return on investment metrics and payback time in, um, decreasing your insur insurance premiums on this and this is just now um, I think we spoke earlier about code if, if I said I've just I built you a house and I built it just to code, it's just safe, it won't go on fire and nobody will get trapped in it, it's not a very attractive value proposition. And it's the same as, well, I've built your building to code. The air quality is just at minimum, the CO2 is just at minimum, the VOCs are just at minimum. We need to adjust the thinking on what code is and what healthy is. Um, and the emerging uh, science now is looking at internal stresses in buildings. And these are the things we've spoken about today, temperature, humidity, dust, allergens, particulates, and so forth. Um, and can we actually now start to reconfigure buildings? And this is, I think, the research symposium presented earlier, is we can get a good, strong evidence base and data. And yes, the WHO are slow. And yes, the medical group are slow. But we have to be, because we can't just change every time somebody has a confirmational bias and they believe personally. You can be absolutely enthusiastic about the technology, but you can be enthusiastically wrong as well. Just because you personally believe it doesn't mean it's right. We must, as medics and as the people who legislate, have a strong evidence base that it works. So this is my encouragement for this group. If we believe in our technologies, go and get a credible peer-reviewed evidence base to persuade legislation that this is the right thing to do. And then, if we live in buildings and schools like this, can we decrease our health insurance premiums and so forth? And that's, I think, the challenge for this society. Um, and as that, this expression of One Health, as I mentioned, I gave a, a keynote at the International Builder Show, and I've met loads and loads of building professionals all talking about ventilation and indoor air quality. And then I crossed over the other side of America, and, uh, and I spoke at the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology, and I met a whole load of healthcare doctors, people like me, talking about healthy air and healthy buildings. But there was no doctors at the Builders Show, and there was no builders at the Doctors Show, and we're all talking about the same thing. And I think one, one fantastic thing about this convening of this group, this society, is it's acting as that bridge. And we see that's our role, our role in our institute, in our academy, 
and what we do, and that's why we're delighted to be part of this group because we think it's a really, really important, important bridge. Um, and I try to teach this, again, I'm not a building professional, but I try to break down, again, all the aspects of health in the indoor environment. We spoke about noise earlier, people turning things off if they're noisy or cold peripheries, being uncomfortable at our desk. You think about 80% about of workers in America are knowledge workers. We're not pulling levers in Victorian uh, warehouses anymore. We're actually sitting at our desk, knowledge and IP. So if you're sitting at your desk, you're going to get cold peripheries. So the whole concept of comfort physiology and building science. So yes, we've got Legionella and all those kind of things down here and toxic and sick building syndrome. But as we move from reactive to proactive, as we go down this end of it, we talk about biophilic design, we talk about access to light, we talk about noise, you're getting more and more into this kind of top right-hand quadrant here of health and wellness. And I think indoor air quality is part of that conversation up there. Of course, it's relevant down here when you find Legionella in your air conditioning, but we really want to be proactive and push people up into this kind of healthy building part of the spectrum. So to steal a phrase again from the International Builders Show, yes, it's great, let's build it healthy, but this society is about how do we keep it healthy. And we talked a lot about surface cleaning, we talked about ventilation, we talked about how ventilation can impact on surfaces and surfaces can impact on, on air quality and how they're connected. So as I said, just in summary, this is our institute and we'd invite you all to, to participate and get involved in that. And we hope to to join in very much and be involved in your group. If you're interested in some of the educational programs that I, that I teach, because Marianne said it has to be a pitch, so this is my pitch. Uh, these are for sale and then there's a bonus off, there's a discount for all members today. Um, th th this is one I particularly encourage you to have a look at. We did this with the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, the facilities management folks, but we've also done healthy home awareness and how do you innovate and how do you actually design new products and services and marketing campaigns for the new air aware consumer and there are those there was air don't cares now there's the larger dynamic is air air aware so with that I'll finish up R remind you of our standards hopefully you understand a little bit more what we do now as regards to asthma and allergy our Academy our Institute and then again just thank chairman Marianne for inviting me here to speak to you today thank you <laughs>